So in this series of videos, we're going to be taking a look at our continuous probability distributions. So in the previous one, we took a look at our discrete, right? That is the result of counting. In this case, we're going to be moving on to our continuous. That is just between the values of one and two, we have an infinite possible of opportunities of possibilities that could exist because we have a continuum of values there. So we're going to move into this continuous realm. Uh, what we're going to start off to take a look at is the uniform distribution. It's a pretty simple one. It's just kind of there to set the stage. Despite that, it's an important one that is utilized quite frequently. From the uniform, we'll move on to utilize and understand our characteristics of the normal distribution. Uh, the normal distribution, that's actually the distribution we have little um, sitting there kind of as a visual. This will be the bread and butter for the remainder of the course. The normal distribution is the biggest one that we will utilize going forward. From the normal, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how to transform this normal into a standard normal. And then we're going to utilize a table in order to determine probabilities from this. Uh, to finish off, what we'll do is we'll take a look at how we can use the normal to approximate a binomial distribution. This becomes really useful in cases where we have discrete data, right? So we have n, we have the number of occurrences being extremely large. So maybe we're looking at, hey, what's the probability of having more than 50 successes in 300 cases, right? We could do that using our binomial, but it'd be very time intensive, very time consuming. It turns out what we can also do is we can approximate our binomial given certain circumstances with our normal, and we'll take a look at how to do that. So that's our overview for this series of videos. Let's jump in. Let's start off by looking at the characteristics of a, prob a continuous probability density function, and then move on to our normal distribution. So let's start off with that. So first thing is, we're going to kind of list these out, but then as we list them out, it's going to kind of be like, okay, just take them for now and then just kind of be like, okay, and then we'll take a look at them once we have our first density function, that is our uniform distribution, and they'll start to make a lot more sense to us come that time. So let's, let's take a look at that. What do we have here? Okay, so here we go. We have our kind of characteristics of our properties of a probability density function. So a density function in probability for any given distribution has the following proper probabilities. Properties. Sorry, not probabilities. Wow. Okay. So first, the graph of this density function will be continuous over its range. So that is between the values of possible x's that we could witness from zero x's or negative infinity x's to infinity x's, whatever that range of value of x is, the graph will be continuous. It won't have any breaks or anything like that popping in throughout it. So great. And right, it says right there, the big reason is because it's a continuous variable and it's defined as being continuous over its range. Second one, what do we have here? The area that is covered under the curve and is produced by the density function is always equal to one, right? And again, this is very similar to when we were drawing our histograms of our discrete probability densities, is if we went and we added up all the bars of that bar chart from, okay, bar of one, bar of x equals two, bar of x equals three, right? And the heights of these probabilities, if we summed that, we would have got one. Right, such that this is saying, hey, the probability of getting between x of 0 and x of 10, if the range of x is between 0 and 10, probability of witnessing a observation of x is 1, 100%. Right, so we had to have that. And again, right, don't get too caught up with these yet. Once we actually see the distribution, once we actually start to play around with it, it'll begin to make more sense. Finally, part three, this is kind of linked to part two. The probability of the assumption of values of random variable to lie between C and D. So if we put two values on our density, on our histogram between C and D, and if we were to calculate the area between C and D, well, that would be the probability of that occurring. So we'll take a look at that as well. So right, it's it's a lot of uh, what's what's happening. Don't get too caught up. This is the formal kind of properties of this. We'll take a look at an actual example, which will help to clarify these. So let's move on and take a look at that example. Okay, so our first example to kind of show us the properties of this probability density function 
is going to also incorporate our introduction into our uniform. So let's presume, let's presume that you're at the bus stop. So you're at the bus stop, you're waiting for a bus, and you've just gone and you've just shown up, right? You actually don't know when the bus comes, you have no idea when the next one will be, you have no idea when the last one came, but what you do know, you do know that a bus comes every 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes. And what we're going to presume is that the bus is just as likely to come in one second, right? It's just right around the corner. It's just going to crest that corner as it is to come in 20 minutes. That is, you just missed it. It just went around the other corner and you're stuck waiting the full time. So in this case here, what we want to do, right? If we wanted to think about this, we'd be like, hey, what are the possible outcomes for how long you have to wait? Well, okay, you could actually list an infinite number of possible outcomes in this sense, right? Because you can say, yeah, sure, I'm waiting for two minutes, but you can also be saying you're waiting for 2.01 minutes, 2.0001 minutes, 2.56, right? There's so many possible, because it's continuous that we could break this time apart into. So it's infinite, right? Absolutely infinite number of possible outcomes that we're waiting for. Second kind of question we could ask Given this unknown that, hey, we know the bus comes every 20 minutes, no idea when it last came, no idea when it comes next, is any time spent waiting more or less likely than any other? And in this scenario, no, all of our time spent waiting between 0 and 20 minutes are equally as likely. So given that all of those times are equally as likely, what we're going to get is we're going to get our uniform distribution. And what the uniform distribution is, let's let's take a look at this guy. Let's take a look at our x-axis. So here we have our x. And in this case here, x is our minutes waiting, right? How many minutes we are waiting for. And we said that we could be waiting between 0 and 20 minutes. Now we're going to have height to this, right? Follow graph. Our height is the probability of x, right? The probability that we wait however long we have to wait for. So in this case here for our uniform, because it's continuous, because it's, right, we don't have these little boxes as to say, okay, zero to one is this probability on and on and on. No, no, it's fluid, it's continuous all the way through. And we said, given that this is all that we know, the probability it comes in zero, or the probability it comes in 20 is identical. Same with the probability that comes at 15, 10, 5, any of the values in between. So in this case here, what we can do is we can work out the probability that it comes at any one and go from there. And what we find is we get a distribution that looks something like, oh, let's make that actually nice and straight, something like this. A nice rectangle where if we wanted to kind of take a look at this, we could say, okay, this value here, our maximum value of x, we could call that point B. Our minimum value of x, we could call that point A. Sorry, I wrote Q, I don't know why that happened. Uh, point A, there we go, that's much better. And then what we could do is we could drag over this kind of maximum point here that we have, this kind of our probability of waiting. And that there, that's our probability, and we can work that out, probability of x to be 1 over b minus a. And so that is, in this case here, 1 over 20 minus 0. That would be 0 0.05, or a 5% chance. Okay. So back to our properties, right? Back to our properties of our probability density function is, okay, the first one, the graph is continuous over its range. So, okay, possible values of waiting for the bus, zero to 20 minutes. Our graph is continuous along that range, right? It's just this rectangle will cross here. Doesn't exist beyond 20, doesn't exist be, uh, below zero. So we're continuous over the range of interest. Second one. The area that is covered under the rec or under the curve is going to always equal to one. So that is, if we wanted to, if we said, "Hey, what is this area underneath our entire probability density function?" 
Well, we can work this out. It's just a rectangle, right? We know how to get the area of a rectangle. The area of a rectangle is base times height. This entire area should equal to 1. So let's, let's double check that. What's our base? 0 to 20. So we have a base of 20. And we have a height of 0 0.05. 20 times 5%, 20 times 0 0.05 gives us 1. So, yeah, right, this is working out. We are saying essentially, right, what that's saying is, hey, what's the probability of waiting between 0 and 20 minutes for your bus? Well, given our assumption that the bus comes every 20 minutes, your probability of waiting sometime between 0 and 20 minutes is 100%. The bus is going to come within that time. So we have that. Okay, the next one then, let's, uh, let's just get rid of this area calculation, actually. Let's keep that area calculation, and I should just be able to go like so. There we go. That's what I want to get rid of, the area there. So the other one that we said is, hey, we could have some point C, some point D, and the probability that event occurs between C and D is the area between C and D. And it's like, whoa, what was that just saying? Okay, what's that saying is that say we were interested in what is the probability that you had to wait between 5 and 10 minutes? All right, so we want to know, hey, what was the probability? Let's write that down. What was the probability that you would have to wait between 5 and 10 minutes for this bus? Well, okay, if we take a look at our diagram here. That is 20, so what, 10 is going to be something like that. There's my value of 10. And 5 minutes, okay, 10, 0, 5 is going to be somewhere around there. 5. And I can figure out, hey, the probability that I'd have to wait between 5 and 10 minutes, I can work this guy here out as the area between C and D, between 5 and 10. This area here, right, all underneath my curve between those points of interest, that will give me my probability of witnessing some value of x, the amount of time waited, between 5 and 10. So how do I find the area of this rectangle? Again, just base times height. In this case, I have a base of 5, and I have a height of 0 0.05. So base times height. 5 times 0 0.05, and that's going to give me a 25% chance that I'm stuck waiting between 5 and 10 minutes. Here's the interesting thing as we use, as we move towards this continuous probabilities, right? As we act with our discrete, right? Or maybe let's just back this up. Back with our discrete variables. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. Let's say that we had instead a discrete random variable. Right? And there's x. Oh, a little bit sideways. Let's redo that. Let's get that a straight line. There's my probability of x. And with our discrete random variables, right, this is something like maybe our binomial. We had a case that looked like this. We had some value there, like so. And then maybe it came back down. Maybe it was roughly symmetric given our value of n and the x we were looking for. Such that, right, this here would have been something like maybe this was x of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, right? And then we had our heights giving us the probability of each one. And in this binomial, I could say, hey, what was the probability that x equals 6? And I would say, okay, probability that x equals 6, that is just this bar here, and carry that across, boom, I get my probability of x equals 6. Okay, I could also say, hey, what was my probability that I had some value of x between 6 and 9? 
and maybe we say between six and nine inclusive. Well, then there'll be six, seven, eight, and nine. Right? That's what we were doing in our previous in our previous uh, videos, and we were just adding up these bars in this case. Well, okay. Let's take a look up here. What did we just work out? Well, we just said, hey, what's the probability of getting some value of x, some time of waiting between 5 and 10? Well, that was, hey, probability of 5 and 10. And we worked that guy out quite easily to be 25%. Right? Very, very similar to what we just worked out here. Hey, probability of 6 to 9. So we can do those just the same. But here is the problem. In this case, can I say, hey, what's the probability that you wait for exactly eight minutes? And in this case here, the probability of waiting for exactly eight minutes is going to be zero. And you might look at this and you might go, what? What? Shouldn't the probability that you wait for exactly eight minutes, shouldn't that be 0.05, 5% chance? Well, no, 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 no. What would be a 5% chance? would be the probability that you waited between eight and nine minutes, right? And if we saw that, let's, uh, let's use yellow to show this on our graph. Probability you waited between eight and nine minutes. Let me just make some room on the graph so we're not as uh, going over top of each other. So probability you waited between eight and nine on the graph would have been, we'll say that was eight. We'll say that was nine. We have our rectangle, base of one times the height of 5%, giving us a 5% probability that I waited between eight and nine minutes. But what's the probability that I waited for exactly eight minutes? That is, I'm sitting there looking at my watch, and as soon as my timer hits eight zero zero boom, the bus pulls up. Well, this probability, this probability is in fact approaching zero. And let's take a look at why that is. So we saw, hey, probability of between eight and nine is 5%. What about, what about, let's just make some room here. What about instead, hey, what's the probability that we wait between eight and Eight minutes, 30 seconds, right? Eight and a half minutes. Well, if we work that guy out between eight and 8.5, so I still have my eight. I now have 8.5 being right there. What happens to my probability now? Well, area of a rectangle, base times height. This is now a base of 0.5. 5 times the height of 0 0.05, giving me a probability of 0 0.025. So hey, my probability of witnessing this is falling. What happens if I go even smaller? What if I go probability of between 8 and 8.1, right? So that's 8 minutes, what, 0 0.1 of a minute is going to be 8 minutes and 6 seconds. So what does that work out to? Well, let's, let's take a look. So we still have our eight probability that we witness eight to 8.1. All right, scale's probably not perfect here. It's getting a bit too small. So, okay, area of this rectangle is gonna give me that. So I have a base of 10%, 0 0.1 times 0 0.05. What does that give me? 0 0.1 times 0 0.05 is going to be a probability of 0 0.005. Right, so what we witness is that as we get into this incrementally smaller band that we're looking at, our probability of actually witnessing that is approaching zero. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You could keep going through this thought experiment, right? You could say, hey, probability that we witness between 8 and 8.01, right? That's a pretty tiny band. And you'll find that your probability of success is, again, really tiny. So in that case there, in our continuous probability distributions, the probability of witnessing exactly some number is always going to be approaching zero. And so when we're dealing with continuous probability distributions, we can never say, hey, what's the probability that x equals 8, x equals 2, 
it's always what's the probability that x is within this range? What's the probability that we wait between 12 and 14 minutes? What's the probability we wait for more than 15 minutes? All of these ranges being considered and ranges are what we're gonna to have to use for our continuous probability distributions. So that does us for kind of our overview of our continuous distributions are kind of our big properties of them. And we used our uniform distribution, nice easy distribution to play with in order to introduce them. Let's just wrap up here by introducing some of our properties of the uniform in particular, such as how we can calculate the average value and the standard deviation of our expectations. So let's take a look at that. So for some, for some uniform distribution, Let's just do it entirely in generic senses here. So we'd have our observations of x. We would have our probability of x. So we have our uniform distribution just being a box. We have our maximum value being notated as b. We have our minimum value being notated as a. And then we have, let's just use a different color to drag this guy out. We have that guy going out like that. That is our probability of x and we said that that guy there is just 1 over b minus a right that's how we worked that guy out we would also have in this distribution we would have some mean right some average some expected value of x that is, if we continually showed up to the bus stop, just having no idea when the bus was supposed to come, just knowing that it was supposed to come every 20 minutes, well, on average, how long would we have to wait? Sometimes we'd wait more, sometimes we'd wait less, but on average, if we took all those wait times and averaged them, what would that work out to be? Well, we can get that. We can get that our average value of x is going to be equal to minimum plus maximum over 2. So essentially, we're just going to take the average of our two extremes. But very similarly, we can work out the variance of this distribution, and from the variance, the standard deviation. And so we get the variance of x, right? x would be the number of minutes waiting if this was our bus example. Our variance is going to be b minus a squared all over 12. Where then, very similarly, we can say our standard deviation is uh, square root of b minus a squared all over 12. So in our previous example that we looked at where we had our bus, so let's go through in our numbers here. This was that we were waiting between 0 and 20 minutes, and that had a height of 0 0.05. We can work out our mean, our average wait time, if we were to continually do this, as well as our standard deviation, right? That is how far we're typically going to fall from that mean. And so let's, let's work that out. Let's see what these values are going to be. So starting off with the mean, our mean is minimum, so 0 plus 20 all over 2. I get a mean of 10 minutes, meaning, okay, on average, I'm going to be waiting 10 minutes for this bus. Again, sometimes I'm going to have to wait a little bit more for the bus. Sometimes I'm going to have to wait a little bit less, but on average, 10 minutes being waited. What about my standard deviation here? So let's go variance and then standard deviation. So what do we have? We're going to have B minus A, so 20 minus 0. That's just going to be 20 squared all over 12. So what does that give me? 20 to the power of 2 divided by 12 gives me 33.33. And technically, right, x was our minutes waiting for the bus. So 33.33 minutes squared, because it's a variance, right? We squared our 20 minutes. So to get our standard deviation, then, we need to take the square root of our variance. So taking the square root of that, we get... 5.77. So 5.77 minutes being our standard deviation. So again, if we wanted to kind of interpret that, we would on average be waiting for 10 minutes for the bus. 
our typical kind of range that we would fall would be 10 up to 15.77 or 10 down to 4.226, so 4.23. That would be our plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation. So we get each of these as we work through our uniform distribution. So those are the characteristics. That is the idea behind our uniform distribution. Again, our uniform distribution, it was just kind of used to bring in our kind of basic properties of a continuous density function. I was introduced as it's a fairly easy distribution to work with. What we're gonna look at now is really our bread and butter for the rest of the course, our normal distribution. So we'll look at characteristics of the normal, or rather the normal family of distributions. We'll move to take a look at what it looks like and how we can actually utilize this guy. So let's jump over and let's take a look at the normal or the Gaussian distribution. So for our normal or Gaussian distribution, really it's referring to a family of distributions that all share the same kind of features. So these features first, First kind of feature is that it is bell-shaped, right? And like I was saying at the introduction here, this has been the standard kind of distribution that we've been using on that splash screen as I do my initial introduction. That is our normal. So it's bell-shaped, and again, given our normal, normal, see this is the problem with calling it our normal distribution, our Gaussian distribution, um, what it is, is given our properties of our continuous distribution, is that the area underneath this entire bell curve is going to fall, is going to equal 1. Second, our second property is that it's perfectly symmetric. So being perfectly symmetric, this means that our mean equals our median equals our mode. So this is going to be actually a pretty important feature that we're going to utilize, we're going to take advantage of quite frequently in working with this, working with this uh, distribution. Our next one, our next guy here is that it falls off smoothly. So falls off smoothly from the mean mean in either direction. So we have our mean and it's gonna fall off in a smooth way in either direction. As it falls off though, right, smoothly in either direction, we would say that the distribution is asymptotic to the x-axis. That is, as the distribution falls off, as it approaches a probability of zero, the distribution will get infinitesimally close to the probability of zero, but it will never, ever, ever actually have a probability of zero. That is, the range of this distribution, the possible values of x, are truthfully from negative infinity to positive infinity. It is completely asymptotic to the x axis. Finally, and well, again, right, these are just kind of our initial properties. We'll take a look at these characteristics and what they mean and how they kind of work through our distribution soon. Final one here. Final one is that the entire distribution, the location, the shape, the entire distribution is being determined by its mean and its standard deviation. So it's mean, mu, and standard deviation. These two things determine the entire distribution. So often what you'll see written is you'll see, hey, some random variable x is distributed normally with some mean and some standard deviation, right? Where this is the mean of x and this is the standard deviation of x. So what it's saying is, hey, our x variable, maybe this is heights, right? So your height, maybe in centimeters, maybe in inches, is a normally distributed variable. And so this normal distribution is going to be determined by some value of the mean and some value of the standard deviation. 
So we'd have that. Let's go and take a look at what exactly this means for us, what exactly all of these characteristics work out to. So let's take a look at a, let's take a look at a normal distribution for that. So freehanding our normal distribution, we'll do our best here. Oh, that's not the tool that I want. There we go. So our normal distribution for x, what it's going to be is we'll have shape that looks something like this. And what we'll find, right, to the best that I could, given freehand for this, is that we have a symmetric distribution. So roughly speaking, right, didn't do a terrible job here. We have mean equals median equals mode, and we would have our mean of the distribution being right there. So great, symmetric, and then from the symmetric distribution, it falls off evenly on both sides. Uh, I've done this a little bit purposefully here. What we witness is that as it falls off evenly on both sides, it never actually touches this x-axis. It gets infinitesimally close, but technically the curve would go all the way off to positive infinity, all the way off to negative infinity, although very, very close to the x-axis. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we kind of ignore the distribution after plus or minus three standard deviations. So yes, it goes all the way off to infinity in either direction, but we only really focus on the first three standard deviations. If we were to find the area underneath this entire curve, it would all sum to one. The other, the final bit there is that, hey, this is defined entirely by its mean and its standard deviation. So standard deviation of x, and the reason why it's defined by its mean and standard deviation, mean tells us where it's located on the number line. The standard deviation tells us how much spread it is over the number line. And the reason being, if we go back to our empirical rule, this is back, oh man, back in week three that we took a look at this, our empirical rule said, hey, for a normal distribution, we had plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviations, plus three, and then we could go the other way. We go minus one, minus two, minus three. We said that within three standard deviations, plus or minus three standard deviations, was going to be 99.9% .9 of our observations, right? So that is 99.9% .9 of our probability falls between plus or minus three standard deviations. There's always a little bit out there, there's always a little bit out there, but that entire area underneath the curve is tiny, right? Very, very tiny likelihood, very, very tiny probability that we would ever witness that. So for all intents and purposes, our distribution is within that plus or minus three. So how does this work out for us, right? Well, the way that this works out, let's take a look at two different scenarios. And let's see if I can draw this, again, recreate somewhat of a decent one. Let's take a look at two variables. Let's take a look at x, and we'll say that x is normally distributed with a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. We'll also take a look at a variable of, let's say, y. And we'll say that y is, actually, let's back up. Let's change colors for y. Let's make y be blue. y is, again, normally distributed, but this time we're going to have, uh, we're going to say we're going to have a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 1. And let's take a look at what exactly this does in each case. So to start off with this guy, and then for our y, We'll compare them. So first guy here, this is my x, this is my y. We have in each case a normal distribution. So up, roughly bell shape, doing my best to make that symmetric. We're saying, okay, it is centered at a mean of 10. So, okay, boom, that's where we find ourselves on the number line at 10. This guy here, that we have a standard deviation of x equal to 3, well, that tells me that I have plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 standard deviations, 
So a standard deviation is 3, so what, that's 10, 13, 16, 19. Going the other way, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, that's going to be 7, 4, and 1. I can say, okay, look, here's my distribution centered around a value of x of 10, and my likely values 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm going to witness some value of x between 1 and 19. All right, that's where I fall. So we see all together, this distribution is kind of covering 18 values of x, centered around 10, though. Well, what about my y distribution? Well, okay, again, it's normal, so let's draw this as normal. And this normal distribution is centered around 5. Okay, there we go, centered around 5. And again, we're going to have plus 1, plus 2, plus 3 standard deviations, where in this case the standard deviation is 1. So that's 5, 6, 7, and 8. Going the other way, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 gives me 4, 3, and 2. So in my case here, we have 99.9% .9 of our observations falling between 2 and 8. That is only really over a range of 6 numbers now, and centered at 5. Same is going to hold for both of these. If we get the area underneath this curve, this entire area is going to sum to 1. If we get the area underneath this curve, the entire area is going to sum to 1. So if we were to take a look at these two kind of on the same number line, we would get a result that looks kind of like this. Let's, let's see if we can do this. So starting off with yellow, let's, uh, let's put our number line, let's say somewhere like there is 10, 20, 0, split to get 5, split to get 15, and we have a rough scale, right? That's really all I'm going for is a rough scale just for this demonstration here. So for our yellow distribution, we'll find that it's going to go, hits our maximum. Actually, you know what? That's probably a little bit too high, to be honest. It's going to go something like this. And ideally, that would be perfectly symmetric. Freehanding it, again, makes it difficult. And right as we went through this, we would have plus or minus three standard deviations, such that, hey, right, values between 1 and 19, well, there would be about 1, there would be about 19. 99.9% .9 would fall between 1 and 19. What about our blue distribution? Well, our blue distribution, this guy centered around 5, falling down really to between 2 and up to, where is it going to be 8? Something around there, 2 and 8. But again, if we worked out the area underneath the curve, it would still have to sum to 1. So the result is this distribution would be a lot more like this. Still bell-shaped. Still symmetric, right? Again, best that I can do freehanding it. Still bell-shaped, still symmetric, but we would spike a lot more at this mean. And if we look at our number line, right, we'll have a much higher probability of falling close to our mean here. Well, actually, same probability falling within same number of standard deviations, but we see that altogether this blue distribution is more tightly packed along the number line. Right? We're more this, we could almost say that this value of five, this mean of five, is a better representation of our possible values of data than this mean of 10. So here what we've seen, right? We've gone through this, we've visualized our normal distribution. This is really just to show us that this value of mean and standard deviation are the two sole kind of determinants as to where we fall on the number line. The mean just where we're located. The standard deviation is really saying, okay, are we a skinny, really tall spiking distribution? Or are we kind of this low spread out 
distribution. The smaller the standard deviation, the more the distribution will spike. The larger the standard deviation, the more this will be more like our yellow one, which is spread out over the number line. So we see the comparison there between the two. So how exactly then do we go about figuring out the areas underneath this curve? Well, we actually are fortunate. Lots of people have come before us and they've created for us tables, stats tables, such that we can just look up, hey, we can look up I witness some value of X, right? We can say, hey, what's the probability that we witness X between five and nine? Well, you can go to a table and you can look up, okay, I have an X value of five, I have an X value of nine. What's the area underneath my curve between these two? Cool, but uh, there's a bit of a problem, right? We said that if X is normally distributed, centered around a mean and standard deviation, centered around a mean and then the standard deviation, how spread out it is, we would technically need to have a different table for every possible normal distribution that exists. And because our mean is a continuous variable, because our standard deviation is a continuous variable, there is an infinite number of possible means. There is an infinite number of possible standard deviations. It appears we have a problem. We would need an infinite number of tables in order to look up every single probability. So we seem to be a little bit stuck. Fortunately, fortunately for us, what we can do is we can transform any normal distribution. So any variable of X, we can transform it from just a generic normal. We can transform X to what we would call Z. And this Z is going to be a distribution that is normally distributed, centered around a mean of zero with a standard deviation of one. And this is what we would call our standard normal. And in this case here, we can turn any X variable, right? Which gives us a infinite number of means, infinite number of standard deviations. Any X variable can be transformed into a Z. By transforming X to Z, we transform this normal from whatever the mean and standard deviation were to zero and one. And because we now have just zero and one all together, we only have one table that we have to look to in order to work out values. So what we're going to look at going forward is we're going to look at how we transform X to a Z. And then once we've transformed X to a Z, we're going to look at how to utilize the table in order to utilize, in order to calculate probabilities. So let's move on to that. So first let's take a look at how we can work out how we can change some X variable into a Z variable. How can we transform this? So to do so, let's take a look at Oh, let's make that a straight line. Well, let's take a look at X, which let's suppose that this is height in centimeters, right? So again, centimeters, these are measured. So this is a continuous variable. And let's suppose that we have some X that is normally distributed. And let's say that the average height is something like 180 centimeters. And let's suppose that there is a standard deviation there of, actually I don't even know what a good standard deviation is for this guy. Let's say a standard deviation of four. So average height is 180 centimeters with a standard deviation of four centimeters. Okay, based off of this then, what we would have is we would have our distribution of X being normal. So roughly along those lines, we are centered around a value of 180 and we have a standard deviation of X of four. So right as we went through, we would have plus one, plus two, plus three standard deviations. That would be 184. 188 and 192. Going the other way, minus one, minus two, minus three. So we would have what, 176, 172, and 168. 
Again, I actually don't know what the true standard deviation of heights is. Um, the mean is about 180. Standard deviation, I just made that up on the spot. So if you're like, I'm way outside of this range, yeah, we're using made up numbers. That's fine. Okay, what we need to do is we need to find some way to transform this x variable and this x distribution into our standard normal. That is, we need to transform x into a z such that as we transform x into a z, this guy is going to just come down and we'll have best that I can redraw a normal. That wasn't bad. A new normal such that z is normally distributed centered around zero with a standard deviation of one. So how do we go about doing this? How about do we get from this x centered around 180 with standard deviation of four to this new guy? Well, the way that we do this is with our standardization formula. Our standardization formula gives us what was called our z score because that's the z value that represents some value of x. And this can be computed as z equals our random variable of interest, x, minus the mean of x. So essentially what it's saying is, hey, I have some x that I'm interested in converting. I'm going to subtract it from my mean. That is, I'm going to turn it into a deviation from mean. I'm going to figure out, hey, I'm five centimeters from my mean. I'm then going to divide this by a standard deviation. So divided by the standard deviation of x. And as I go through this, what it's going to do is it's going to convert all of my values of x's into some value of z. So like I said, let's suppose we have right here, what do we say? Just beyond one standard deviation, 184. Let's say we have value here of 185. And I want to figure out, hey, what is my corresponding Z score? Well, if I wanted to work through that, I'm going to have 185 minus 180 all over 4. So as I work through that, 185 minus 180 gives me, hey, my value of X has deviated 5 centimeters from the mean. And a standard deviation is 4 centimeters. Which means that what I have here is 5 over 4, or 1.25. That would be my corresponding Z score, 1.25. Where this 1.25, what it's really telling me, it's telling me how many standard deviations I am from the mean. Right? And hey, I was five centimeters away, a single standard deviation was four centimeters, so that is I'm just a bit more than one standard deviation away from my mean. To show this, we can, we can calculate another one. We can go and actually calculate a standard deviation from the mean. So let's take a look at 176, right? Keep in mind, 176, this was minus one standard deviation. So as we work through that, yeah, z equals my x value. So what I'm interested in converting, 176, minus my mean, okay, all over a standard deviation. And so what am I? 176, that's four centimeters away from my mean, negative four centimeters. And a standard deviation is four centimeters. That gives me a Z score of negative one. And sure enough, right, that was negative one standard deviations. So in this sense here, as I'm converting any X distribution into a Z distribution, what I'm really doing is I'm just converting it into number of standard deviations from my mean. Hence why my mean becomes zero, because zero, my mean is zero standard deviations from my mean. Right? And in that way there, really what I get as I work my way out, I would get plus two standard deviations if I were to bring down 188. 192 would give me a Z score of plus three. And then working backwards, same kind of idea. 172 would drop down to be minus two. 
168 would be dropping down to be minus 3. And we see, okay, I didn't really draw this normal distribution very good. We should be almost petered off. Not very much area left beyond 3. But again, we're freehanding it. We're just doing, we're doing the best we can with that. And I can convert any value. Let's do one more just to really drive the point home. Let's say we want to know what is my Z score of a value of 190. So if I had 190 centimeters, if I was 190 centimeters tall, what is going to be my corresponding Z score? So Z will be 190 minus 180 all over number of standard deviations. So I'm going to get 10 over 4. Ah, I can work that out quite easily. 10 over 4, that's going to be 2.5 standard deviations. So somebody 190 centimeters tall is 2.5 standard deviations above the average height, given my assumption of standard deviations. So perfect. We've gone through now how to calculate, how to work through our Z scores. What we want to take a look at next is we want to take a look at how exactly do I look up my probabilities. So that is, let's, let's take a look. What if I wanted to know, what if I wanted to know what is the probability of having a height that is greater than or equal to 190 centimeters, right? What's the likelihood of you being taller than that? So if we go back to our diagram, really what we're saying is, hey, what's this area here? Right, I had my 190. I can work out the area under a curve, just like we did with our uniform. And I'm saying, hey, what's the probability that I'm taller than 190? Well, that's going to be all of this, all the way out to infinity. Well, that's what it is in that curve. We are going to be focusing on the Z score which is really, we could almost translate this. The actual question is saying, hey, what's the probability that X is greater than 190? We can translate this to say, hey, what's the probability that Z is greater than or equal to 2.5? And right, that's gonna work out to be the area underneath this, again, as shaded out all the way out to infinity. So let's take a look at how we utilize the table and work from there. So to a table, let's jump over to our textbook. If you've been comfortable with the black screen so far, maybe you're sitting in a dark room, brace yourself, the textbook is pure white. So as I jump screens, it's gonna get really bright here. Okay, so here we have our textbook. This is from openstacks.org. This is the textbook we've been utilizing. In our table of contents, well, what we would want to do is if we go just past chapter 13, we have Appendix A, which is statistical tables. If we go here, and you can start to just scroll down, but it's quite a ways down. The way that I find best is just to do uh, Control F, that is, or Command F if you're on a Mac, and search for a normal. As you go normal, it says, okay, what about this one here in your table of contents? No, no, that's the chapter for the readings for what we're covering now. But let's go back. And what we get is our standard normal probability distribution, our Z table. And anytime you're looking at any stats table, it is crucially important that you take a look at the picture on the top of the table. Because this picture is always telling you which area you're finding, which probability you're finding, right? And in this case here, the area that we're finding, the probability that we're finding, let me just uh, jump like this so I can write on this screen here. Give me one second. There we go. So in this case here, the area that we're finding is between some Z score that we've looked up so in our case, we were interested in a Z of 2.50. Oh, that's uh, light green on white, not really work well. Maybe uh, maybe blue, they don't give me many options for writing on white. That's a bit better. Maybe if I make it fatter, that will be better. There we go. So we had a Z score of 2.50.
So when we go and look up this Z score in our table, it's going to give us a area, a probability underneath the curve between 2.50 and 0. Keep in mind, what we were trying to find out was not that area. We were interested in the probability that we were bigger than 2.50. We were interested in this probability out here in the tail. So, okay, this is where we need to take advantage of some of our characteristics, some of our properties of a density function. First property is that the entire area from negative to positive infinity, this entire area underneath it, that's 1, right? 1.00. So first kind of feature, first thing we want to take advantage of. Oh, oh no, I moved things around. There we go. Okay. So first thing we want to take advantage of as we go through this. Second one is the characteristic of the normal, which is that, hey, this distribution is perfectly symmetric. That is mean equals median. If we go back to what the median means, that's the middle number. That means 50% of observations are smaller than the median. 50% are bigger. So given that, between my mean, and some value of infinity, this whole area underneath the curve, right, this blue one and this green one, is going to be 50%. Whole thing is 100%. My mean is also my median, so 50% are bigger. So between there and infinity is 50%. So now, when I get my distribution that I'm wanting, my area that I'm wanting, the green bit, I'm going to look up the blue bit in the table. I want the green bit. So what I have to do is I have to take my total, subtract off the blue that I've looked up here, right? Subtract off the blue, and I'd be left over with the green. So that's going to be kind of my idea behind it. And maybe, maybe I just lost you on that. You're like, I just need to see this, Keith. That's fair. Well, let's go through how we can look this up. So given that I've just written all over this, I have to erase that in order to scroll down and take a look. So let's go scroll down and see what's happening here. We were looking for a Z score of 2.50. So the way that we use this table in order to look up values, we start off on the left hand side and we go down, we go down until we find our first bit. So there's two. Okay, we want 2.5, right? This is saying 2.0. So we want 2.5. Five. From here, we then go across for our second, our second decimal point. So 2.5 going across, we see 2.50, 2.51, right, as we went on all the way to 2.59. Well, we're just looking for 2.50 or 2.500. So I'm going to be using this first column. So first column gives me 0. 4938. So let's go write that back down. 0 0.4938. There we go. So between 2.5 and the mean, I had an area of 0.4938. Keep in mind what I'm looking for. We said, hey, what's the probability of being a Z greater than 2.5? So we're looking for this green area. So to get this green area, I have to recognize that from here all the way to infinity is a 50. Oh, maybe that doesn't work, writing right over top of the letters there. From the mean all the way up to infinity, that is a 50% probability of occurring. So given that, okay, 50% all the way up to infinity, this guy made up 49.38. What's my leftover? Well, my leftover then, my leftover, that's going to be 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4938. So, okay, what does that work out to? 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4938. I get a... 0 0.0062. So that works out to what? If you want to turn that into a percentage, 
that would be 0.62% chance that you would be more than 2.5 standard deviations from the mean. Or to put it another way, if we go back to our example here, all right, if we go and take a look at it in this sense here, we just went, we said, okay, this guy here, 0 0.0062. Or probability we were taller than 190 centimeters, 0 0.0062. That is, given the situation, we're saying oh, that's pretty unlikely that you would be taller than 190 centimeters. Again, again, presuming that my standard deviation of 4 centimeters is correct. Right? If we knew what the actual standard deviation of people were, and the actual average height of people, we could work out the true probabilities of them being between different heights and the like. So could work that out if we had all of that extra information, which we don't right now, right? So we can do some other fun things with this too. Let's, let's go make a new page and let's practice a little bit in looking up z-scores and finding probabilities. And really this is a skill that you want to be able to do rather effortlessly because I promise you the rest of this course is looking at probabilities underneath the normal distribution. We do different things with it. We have different kind of versions of this normal distribution, different kind of adaptations of it. But the rest of this is just utilizing the normal, utilizing areas underneath the normal to find probabilities. So this is the fundamental, the concrete skill you need going forward to be successful. So let's play around with another example. Well, let's suppose in this case here, ah, we have green, okay. Uh, in this case here, we have X, and let's suppose we have our normal distribution. And so we have some normal distribution, oh, Nope. We have X being normally distributed, centered around, let's say 100, with a standard deviation of 15. So, okay, if we wanted to visualize that, we would have standard deviation of 15, sorry, mean of 100, right? If we go back to this, this is our mean. This is our standard deviation. So we have a mean of 100 and we have a standard deviation of 15. In this case, let's presume that we want to know what is the probability that we have between, let's say, 105 and 125. So we witness some value of x between 105 and 125. So okay, if we wanted to visualize where that is going to be, 105, maybe that's something like that. Let's use a straight line here. And maybe 125, maybe that's more out like this. 105, 125, and I want to know, hey, what's the probability of witnessing a value of x between those two guys, so within this shaded range here? Well, okay, in order to do this, great question, but I can't answer it based off of x values. I need to convert all of this into a z in order to be able to compute this. So that's my first step, is to convert these x values into z values. So, okay, from X to Z. So that is, I need to figure out what is 105 as a Z value and what is 125 as a Z value. So to work these out, I'll call 105 Z1. That's gonna be 105 minus 100, right? Remember what we're doing here, X minus our mean, divided by my standard deviation. So divided by 15. That's my standard deviation of x. So in this case here, I have 5 over 15. That's going to give me 0.333. So 0 0.33 as my first z value. 
z2, same idea happening here. I'm going to take my x value, my observation of interest, minus my mean, divided by my standard deviation. So, okay, 125 minus 100 all over standard deviation of 15. So what does that work out to? 25 over 15 gives me 1.67. And what we can notice here, if we go back to kind of our table that we were looking at, our table was only reported to two decimal places. Our table was only reported to two decimal places, so in each of these cases, well, we don't need to report any farther. So we just want to leave it as that. From here, we now want to figure out what is my corresponding probabilities. So, okay, this yellow line that I'm dragging down, this was my z value of zero. This was my mean. So the first thing I want to figure out, first thing I want to figure out is, hey, what is this probability between 0.33 and my mean? Once I get that one, I'll then want to work out what's my probability of witnessing between 1.67 and my mean. Ultimately, I'm interested in the green area, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bigger probability attached with 1.67, subtract the smaller probability so we cancel off this bit here, and all we'd be left with is the green. So let's jump over to our table, let's look up our probability attached with 0.33, and to do that, 0.33 we go down the left side to 0 0.3, we cut across to where there's that other 0 0.03, and we would get a probability attached with that guy there of 0 0.33, 0 0.1293, 12.93%. Okay. Do the same thing for our 1.67, so we go down the left hand side till we get to 1.6, we go across until we get to 1.67, and that yields a probability of 0.4525. So 0 0.1293, 0 0.4525, to get our green probability, we're going to take the bigger one, subtract from the smaller one to get rid of, right? Essentially, that's going to cancel out this red bit here so that all we're left with is the green. So probability for the green, that is probability that we have 105 less than X less than 125. That's going to be 4525 minus... 0.1293. So that will work out to be a probability of 0 0.3232. So a 32.32% chance of witnessing a probability between those two values whatever my value of x was representing in this case, right? So we have our way that we would look up values on the z table. We took a look at our first example where we said, hey, greater than some value. We then took a look at, hey, between two values. What we're going to take a look at is now what happens if we kind of bridge that mean. So let's take a look at one more example looking at that scenario there. So once again, we have our x-axis, and in this case, let's give it some context. In this case, we're going to have income, and we're going to presume that income, so our x variable, is normally distributed, centered around 45,000 with a standard deviation of 15,000. So, okay, average income, 45, standard deviation, 15. Um, so we don't have to carry around all of these thousands. Let's just change this, and let's say that this is going to be income in thousands of dollars. All right, save us, save us a little bit of trouble here. 
So we're going to have our normal distribution, our Gaussian distribution. That guy is going to be centered around our mean. We're saying that our mean is 45. And again, I'm just writing 45 because I'm saying my x's are in thousands of dollars. It makes it a bit easier for me. And then the standard deviation of x is $15,000. Okay, in this case here, what we're interested in, we want to know what's the probability that you go out into the wild and you survey somebody and you find that you want to know what is the probability that they earn between uh, 35 and $50,000 a year. So, okay, let's actually write that properly. That $35 and $50,000 a year. So X is greater than $35,000 but less than $50,000. Okay, well, we can, we can denote that. So that is going to be 50. Now let's say 50 is something like there. And 35, we'll say that 35 is somewhere like this. So we're looking for, we're looking for this area here. More than 35, less than 50. That area there underneath. The curve. So 50, 35. Okay, again, great question. How do we approach this? We have the initial setup, all of our information down. We visualized it. We now need to calculate. How do we calculate? Well, what we need to do, first step, always the first step, is we need to convert our x to a z, right? We can't do anything with the x's themselves. We need z values. So let's convert 35 to a Z, 50 to a Z. And then for comparison, we could drag down 45, our mean. We know that's going to be zero because Z distribution is centered around zero with a standard deviation of one, right? We, we know that. So working this out, let's start off with, oh, let's start off with the lesser one, 35. So we'll say that Z1 is 35 minus our mean of 45 all over my standard deviation of 15. So, okay, what do I get? I get negative 10 all over 15. That's going to be negative 0 0.67. Negative 50. Z2 is going to be 50 minus 45 all over 15. So that's 5 over 15, that's 0 0.33. So okay, I have each of my z values. Keep in mind, my next step is to find out the probability of this guy and the mean, and the probability of this guy and the mean. So each of these respective probabilities. Let's start off with this guy here, 0 0.33. So again, we'll go back to our table going down the left-hand side till we get to 0 0.3, and then across till we get to 3, 3. And that there is a probability of 0 0.1293. So between 50 and the mean, this bit here would be a 12.93% likelihood. What about between negative 0.67 and the mean? Well, we go to our Z table, and you'll notice we have no negative values. And you're like looking through, scrolling up, scrolling down, going, oh no, where are my negative values? Don't fret, don't worry, right? One of our big characteristics of our normal distribution is that it's a symmetric distribution. So that is the area between 0 0.67 and the mean is the same as between positive 0.67 and the mean. So our table only represents the positive values because of the symmetry. We don't need to just duplicate the same numbers again. So what we're going to do is we're just going to ignore the negative. All that that negative tells us is that we're to the left of the zero. We're to the left of the mean. The probability is going to be the exact same as 0 0.67. So let's go take a look at that. Down the left-hand side to 0.6 and then across to 0 0.07. And that gives us 0 
2486. Okay. In this case, right, that was between 35 and 45 that we just calculated as a 24.86% chance. What we're interested in is between 35 and 50. So to get that entire area, we need to add together each side of this, of what we calculated. So we'll take 0.2486 and we'll add on to it 0.1293. And that will give us a probability that we were between 35 and 50 or between a z-score of negative 0.67 and 0.33. Probability of 0 0.377. Nine, or a 37.79% chance that if we picked out somebody at random from a population with an average income of 45,000 and a standard deviation of 15,000, well, there'd be a 37.79% chance that they earned between those income ranges. So we've looked at three different examples, three different ways that we can play around with the normal distribution. Again, this is something that I would highly recommend for you to play around with. There's lots of practice questions in our textbook that you can kind of compare with. You can work through, get your answer, compare it, say, okay, did we get the same answer or not? Then from there, go back, take a look at a few other ways. I'll work through at least another example or two here just to really drive the point home. If you're comfortable with this, Feel free, right? We've done three examples. That's good. You can stop the video here. The next video is going to be taking a look at our binomial distribution and how we can approximate that binomial with the normal. So I'll go work through another example or two here in this video. But if you're comfortable with this, feel free to jump on to the next video at this point. Okay, so here's another question to take a look at. A little bit of different things that we're working out. We have to kind of recall some information from the previous ones. Take a look at this, see what you can do with it, and then I'll start working through it and see where we go. So you got three seconds here, pause the video, otherwise I'm about to uh, kick off in working through this question. Three, two, one, let's go. So okay, we're taking a look at your buying a used Honda Civic 2013. According to AutoTrader, the prices are normally distributed with an average of 9,500. So let's just let's just write that down. We have an average of 9,500 and a standard deviation of 900. Okay, and we said that hey, these prices are normally distributed. So we could go okay, X is normally distributed, centered around 95 with a standard deviation of nine. Great. We then want to know what price would you pay to be in the top decile of purchases and what is the value of the first, second, and third quartiles. So, okay, we have to go back and think about what exactly do deciles and quartiles mean. Well, before that, let's just, let's just draw our distribution so we get an idea as to what we're looking at. So we have X. We have a normal distribution looking something like that. And we have that we are centered at our mean, and what do we say our mean price was? $9,500. We then have a standard deviation of 900. Now, mind you, if you wanted, you could change X to be in terms of hundreds of dollars. So that would just be 95 and 9, right? Just changing the scale. Other than that, we'd get the same results. You just have to change everything to be in hundreds at the end, but I'm going to leave it as it is. It's not too bad. So first thing, what price would you pay to be in the top decile of purchase prices? So okay, let's remind ourselves what a decile is. Decile is a 10th percentile, right? So your first decile is your 10th percentile, meaning 10% of observations are less than this value. To be in the top decile would mean that 90% of observations are smaller than some amount, or alternatively 10% are bigger. So that is in this case, what we're looking for is we're looking for some value, right? Something like that, such that, okay, here's some value of X, so that if we go this way, 
10% of our observations are bigger than x. That is, on the other side, 40% are smaller. And right, 40 and 10 gives me 50 on this half of the distribution. The other half of the distribution would be, again, 50%, such that the whole thing sums to 1, right? That was one of our, one of our features. Well, we don't have an x value. This looks, this appears problematic. Well, let's keep in mind what we do. We always need to have something with a z. In this case, what we want to do is instead of saying, hey, we are going to calculate some value of z and then go to our table and look up the probability between that value of z and 0, we want to do the opposite. We want to go to the table and we want to find a probability of 40% and find out what z value is attached to that. So in order to do this, let's bring up our let's bring up our table here. And again, right, keep in mind the table is going to be white, so it's going to be a pretty big shock as the screen jumps, so just uh, be aware of that. So we're looking for 40%. So let's jump and take a look. So we're looking for 40%. So in this case here, right, in our previous cases, we had said, okay, here's our Z value. We'll go down the left-hand side, find the value across the top, find that second decimal place, go down to the probability. Well, now we're doing the opposite. In this case here, we know the probability we're looking for. We're looking for 40%. We want to find out what Z value is attached to it. So in this case, we're going to go into the meat of the table here. That is this middle part. And we, what we want to do is we want to start off by finding about 40%. So as we go down, okay, I have 0 0.3770 there, 0 0.4131. So there we go. Right here between these two guys, I have 40%. Keep in mind that's right in between 0.3997 and 0 0.4015. Now, okay. Best practice typically when using the tables is just to go for the closer value. So that is, hey, in this case here, 0.3997. That's really darn close to 40%, right? That's closer than this next guy. So we should just go and take 1.28 as the value there. Okay, that's often best practice. Another common way that you'll see this done is to say, okay, even though this guy's closer, because 40% is right in between these two, right? Because 40% is right in between, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna take an average between the two and you're gonna use 1.285, right? And where did I get that 1.28 from? Well, 1 1.28 and then five to say that we're going right in between. So this would be a case where we're using actually a Z value to three decimal places. And in that case there, we're kind of saying, yeah, it's right in between, right? That five saying it's right in between these two guys there. And that's the one that we would use. For this example, I'm going to go and use this 0.3997, so just 1.28. Uh, keep in mind that for our weekly quizzes, the way the answer keys are set up, most of the time, most of the time there's enough fudge room worked in that you could use either method and get the right result. But the way that the answer key is set up is actually based off of that you would use 1.285 for those few questions. And again, that would only be for the questions where we're looking for probability to Z value. So that's how we could look that up. Let's jump back. Let's put in our Z value, 1.28, and let's finish, uh, let's finish solving this question. So bringing that back over, we're going to get 1.28. 0.28, such that this guy here was that 0 0.3997. Not exactly 40, but the best we can do given the table. If you watch subsequent videos, we'll take a look at how to calculate this exactly using Excel or R. Keep in mind the D2L quizzes, the D2L quizzes are set up assuming you're using the table. So it's a good way to check your work. It's a good way for, say, an exam to see what's happening. Um, but the D2L quizzes where they want a specific answer, they're set up assuming you're using the table. So 0.3997, that, that's close enough. Okay, so what are we doing from here? We got our probability to our Z. We're just going the opposite way through this question, right? What we want to do now is, well, typically when we convert X to Z, we go Z equals X minus mu 
all over the standard deviation? Well, in this case, what do we know? We know that z is 1.28. I don't know what my x is. I know that my mean is 9,500. And I know that I have a standard deviation of 900. I have one unknown, right? This is just a bit of an algebra game. We can solve for this. So first thing, let's get this 900 up to the other side. So we want 900 times 1.28. That's going to give me 1152 equals x minus 9,500. So to get x by itself, I'm going to add 9,500 to both sides. And I'm going to get 10, 652 equals x. Meaning, if I go back up and take a look at that, that's saying that if I get to sell my Honda Civic for $10,652, well, I'm going to be just right at that cutoff point to be in the top decile of car sales, the highest possible price available. So, again, how do we work through this? All of our previous examples, we went from x to z to some probability, right? In this example, we had to work the other way. We had some probability, that 0.4, which we looked up the closest one to. From that probability, we then went to the z value. From that z value, we then went up to the x. So again, for most things in this, if we work through it one way, we should be able to work through it again in reverse going the other way. And that's exactly what this example here is. Now for deciles, well, same kind of idea. Keep in, or sorry, the quartiles, same kind of idea. Keep in mind what quartiles are. Quartiles are such that 25%. So right, we would say that there would be 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, and then all of that out that way, 0 0.25. This would be my first quartile, my second quartile, and my third quartile. So in that case there, what you want to do is you want to go to the table and you want to find out, hey, what is 0 0.25, what Z value is attached to 0 0.25? And again, you're looking at the meat of the table and your closest value there is going to be 0.2486. That 0.2486, that is attached to, oh, I lost it here, where was it? 0 0.67. So, okay, in this case, that's a negative 0 0.67. Our quartile 3, that's going to be positive 0 0.67. From here, well, again, you know your Z, you know your mean, you know your standard deviation. You would have negative 0 0.67 equals x minus 9,500 all over 900. And you could work through, you could solve for your x value. And then again, same thing when you have the positive 0 0.67. And then that way there, you can get your first, second, and third quartiles. Well, rather 0 0.67, that'd be your first and third. Your second quartile, that's your median, your 50th percentile. What's your median? Quartile 2? 9,500. We have a symmetric distribution. So mean equals median. So that would be our walkthrough for that question there. Working through things backwards, again, a skill that you'd want to be comfortable working with. Next example, we'll play with this a little bit, a little bit more. Okay, so another example to take a look at here. In this case, so what do we have over here? In this case, we have distances which students live from school tends to be normally distributed in the case such that the average distance from school is 5K with a standard deviation of 1.5. Okay, suppose we have a given student that lives so close to the school that 99.7% of students live farther from the school than they do. How far does this student live from the school? Okay, so how would we work this out? So, again, pause this, try to work through it. Highly recommend you try to work through this. Otherwise, here we go. So, what we have is 
we have a distribution. We have x, which is distance from school, being normally distributed with a mean of 5 and a distance or a standard deviation of 1.5. So if we were to take a look at that, we have x, distance from school, and normally distributed looking something like that. So, okay, maybe not my best normal out of all the ones I've drawn so far, but we get the idea. So we're centered around 5. Now, okay, this is all the different distances from school, and the height is the probability or the frequency you could think of as how many students, how far they live away from the school. So, hey, most students live around 5K from the school. Maybe this is where the city center is. And then we get farther and farther away. We get fewer and fewer students. But we have some student that lives so close to the school that 99.7 live farther away, right? So, hey, if this is distance, and our number line, right, going from zero all the way out to infinity. Well, they live so close, zero would be at the school. They live so close that 99.7 live farther away than they do. So that's going to be some value so close to the school that all of this, all of that is 0 0.997, right? 0.9997. Or to break this down another way, we could say that this red area is 50%, and this green area here, ah, what's this green area? 0 0.497, right? Such that again, mean equals median, so 50% greater than that, and 0.49 between that guy and that guy. So altogether now, we have a probability. This is, again, a type of question where we're going the opposite way. We're going from a probability to a Z to an X. So we have our probability. From here, we want to jump over to the Z. So to jump over to the Z, we want to look up what Z value is attached to that. And to do that, let's take a look. We're looking for 0.497. So again, we're looking in the meat of the table for that. And 497, we actually have that exact value here. And that exact value for 497 is a Z stat of 2.75. 2.75. So we needed to bring this down. We need to change that to a Z. And that was a Z of 2.75. That is for 2.75, the probability between there and the mean is 0 0.4970. Okay, from here, we need to say, great, we want to know what is our value of X. How far does this student live from the school? They don't live 2.75, that's 2.75 standard deviations. We didn't know the actual distance in kilometers, right? That's what we're measuring. We have km, km. Okay, here's where we need to be careful, right? And I almost made this mistake just going through this example. Our Z table is all recorded in terms of positive numbers. But in this case here, as we look at it, we were looking for a value to the left of the mean. We have a Z value then to the left of zero. So this is actually negative 2.75. And we need to watch for that, right? We need to be careful of that, that we don't make that mistake. We'll get completely bogus results if we do. From here, we look at our standardization statistics. So Z equals X minus mu, all over the standard deviation. We know Z, we know mu, we know the standard deviation. X is what we're looking for. So let's do some algebra. Negative 2.75 equals x minus my mean of 5 all over your standard deviation. What did we say our standard deviation was? 1.5? Okay. Working through that, we get negative 2.75 times 1.5. So 2.75 times 1.5, that's going to give me... 
all of that equals x minus 5. So 4.125 plus 5. 9.125. Oh, see, made that mistake. Even though I had my negative, I dropped it again. It's not 9.125. Let's back up here. Negative 4.125. So negative 4.125 plus 5 gives me 0 0.875. So this student who lives so close that 99.7% of students live farther than them, they live 0.875 kilometers from the school or 875 meters from the school. So yeah, yeah, they, they, they live pretty close. They live pretty close. Right, we could then throw in, just kind of get a bit more of our traditional kind of practice because all of these questions have been in this little bit more of a difficult way of P to X. Let's go and take a look at an example where we're going x to p. Let's suppose that instead, let's just make some room here so we can compare back. Let's suppose that in this case, we wanna work out, hey, what is the probability that a student lives more than, uh, more than six, no, let's say more than six k from the school. So what's the probability they live farther than six k from the school? So in this case, what do we want to do? Well, we want to identify, hey, this is five, something like that. That's likely six. Which area am I looking for? Well, I want the probability that X is bigger than six. So that's going to be this side. To work this out, well, to work that guy there out, I need to convert it to a Z. All right, this is the case where I'm going X to z, z to p. So to z, six, I know that five, that's gonna come down to be zero. So z is six minus five all over 1.5. So one over 1.5, that's gonna give me 0 0.67. So 0 0.67 being my Z statistic, right? I see this sometimes. Hey, we got 0 0.67, that's between zero and one. This is our probability. Woo, we got our answer, but no, no, no. Z equals 0 0.67. This is our Z stat. We're gonna go look that up now. So we jump over to our table. We go down the left-hand side till we get to 0 0.6. We cut across to 0 0.67 and we get 0.2486. There we go. So 0.2486, that was this red area. But keep in mind, we're not looking for this red area. We don't want this red area, we want the blue area. So from there all the way out to infinity is 50%. And we just want from here out to infinity, right? Now I messed up my color, so let's just go. We want this yellow one now. So if we want that yellow bit, well, we take 0.5, we minus this, and the leftover is gonna be our yellow. So 0.5 minus 0.2486 is gonna give us 0 0.2514. So 25.14% of students live farther than 6K from the school. There we go. We have our result. So a few more examples that we've worked through. Hopefully that's really helped in how we can work through this, how we can play with the normal distribution. Next video, we're going to be taking a look at our using our normal to approximate the binomial distribution. And that will finish us up for this chapter on normal and continuous distribution functions. If you have any questions, feel free, post to the D2L frequently asked questions. Feel free to shoot me an email.